Thank you. Right. Floor is yours. Yeah, you can hand it off as you wish. I think in previous conversations we've talked about we have a number of services that we historically just kind of renewed or brought to you with short notice where as a commission, not necessarily this commission, uh, a renewal will be impending and we may not have had enough time to, to pivot if we wanted to. And so uh, you may recall James Charlesworth gave a presentation as related to our general liability insurance and renewal with uh, assurance as our uh, broker. And the intention was to kind of give you an education on that and, and give you an option of whether you want to go to market or what you want to do. This is Bob Charlesworth. <laughs> so he helps us with our health insurance, and we're kind of at that same point. We're trying to be strategic in terms of uh, giving you a, a, an overview of how we attack uh, health insurance as an organization. With the, uh, Bob's the expert in terms of what the market uh, looks like and how to take advantage of that. And then at the end of this conversation, we'll talk about options going forward and how you want to proceed. But I have had a chance to review his uh, PowerPoint. Uh, and there's a lot of technical acronyms in there that I'm confident he's going to walk us through. And mm -hmm. So I'll turn it over to, to Natalie and Bob. Okay, I got mid. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you want me to stand or how you want me to go. <laughs> if you could be where that camera can see at least right, everyone. Camera. Yeah, take one of these chairs. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. make like a fireside chat. Just that works with me. <laughs> works with me. A lot of moving parts. Uh, thank you again. My name is Bob Charlesworth. I'm vice president of Charlesworth Consulting. Very creative name. Uh, this is my 35th year. Uh, James, you met earlier, is my younger brother by many years. That's why he's the president. I'm the vice president. Uh, there's a future with him. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is kind of the working parts of group benefits. So it's a lot of moving parts. Uh, ran this by Natalie. It's again, there's a lot of some acronyms in there, but I kind of just want to walk you through where the city is and what's going on as we see it. Uh, this is a little summary of our firm. Um, James, again, you've met James, he's my younger brother. Uh, Connie does some statistical stuff with subrogation, uh, she does some subrogations for a lot of our cities. Uh, Peter is a new hire. Peter was an assistant city attorney for a city in Kansas. We hired him in January, and Haley just joined us a few months ago, and she kind of corrals us and keeps us in play. But we're officed in downtown Kansas City now, um, so I take the 30-minute, 30 30-mile 30 trek every morning. That takes me an hour in each way, so I'd like to be in Salina. Uh, a little bit of understanding, um, what we're going to talk about today a little bit, is fully insured versus self-insured. And the city is what we consider self-insured. Uh, your claims are your claims. Uh, when you transfer a risk, like fully insured programs, your taking your dollars and transferring it to a carrier to take that financial risk, good or bad. Uh, obviously, the larger you are, the more predictable you are. It doesn't make you the cheaper one. Uh, I've got groups in Missouri that are 60,000 people. It doesn't make it cheaper. They just make it more predictable. Uh, it's more actually uh, looking for. But we're, for years, the city has taken their risk assumption philosophy that we're going to handle our own claims where the size where our claims are us. It looks like us. But we're going to uh, purchase some protection for the worst case scenario. So today we're funding uh, the program and we're going to talk about 2020 how it works. We're going to talk a little bit about co employee contributions and how that plays into it, defined contributions. Uh, that was a big buzzword several years ago. Uh, some wellness activities, that's a big deal now, participation versus outcomes base. Uh, as my dad would say, an outcomes base should have gone done to meddling uh, with people, but it's important to talk about. Community-based plans are a big buzzword today. We'll talk about some of how that works. Associational trusts and pools are available for public entities especially. And then we're going to talk about some marketing direction. Uh, and to kind of read what Mike was talking about, we've already got a city renewal in a minute. I don't want to preempt it too quickly, but there's time to do something if you want to do something. So we're not pinched today or anything like that. So, uh, and it's pretty solid. But I at least want you to know we don't wait till the very last minute to get everything. And I'm sorry. Yes. Well, what what is PPACA? Okay. Uh, I I just was... yeah the that's PACA that's the patients uh, uh, that's the Affordable Care Act. Okay. Patient okay. Protection okay. Affordable yeah. Care Act. Okay. And there are fees, and I'll touch on that real quick <coughs> on the fully insured. Yes, it's actually on the next slide. Um, on the on the PACA fees, 
Uh, what this is, is that when you're fully insured, you pay that full amount, and that varies every year. And for 2020, that's estimated to be 2.4%. It varies. Um, and that's on the fully insured premium. So if you have a million dollar premium, you're going to pay $24,000 in taxes. Now, if you're self-funded, that only applies to... The who is the entity? The entity is built into the rates. The insurer has to build that into the rates. For 2019, as we sit here, the federal government said zero. It was wonderful. So we're getting all of our renewals for 1-1, one, one, and if you're fully insured, you automatically saw a 2.4% rate increase just because of taxes. Even if you were good, you would see that impact. The year before that was 3.4%. So obviously it can vary, and this is a federal government tax, which helps fund the Affordable Care Act, the insurance exchanges. So, what we're and of course, insurers, they take all the risk. If you transfer that risk to them, again, it's a risk assumption, risk transfer. Uh, they take all the claims, all the appeals, all the fiduciary responsibility. When you self-fund, it kind of comes back a little bit on to the city. Um, again, on the PAPACA fees, it's only uh, on the stop loss and administration fees. So, that 2.4% is going to impact about 15% of your overall cost, much less impact. Um, and then the PCORI, which is the patient center, I'm going to get it all wrong, uh, it's a research fee uh, that continues and it's supposed to continue, I think, for two more years. It's about $2.75 per member per year, not per employee, per member on your plan. But what I want to touch on is TPA versus insurer. This is important. The city has a, 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 an agreement with Blue Cross of Kansas. Um, the Blues are, are interesting to work with in Kansas, good people. Um, they're very large, they insure probably 80% of all the business in central, in central Kansas. But what the city has done, we, the city says, I'll tell you what, we want to borrow your provider network, we want to use your stop loss provisions, and we'll talk about stop loss, and we want you to administer our, clam, our claims. And it looks like fully insured, but you're not. You get claims every week to pay. But we also provide protections on that. We, being Blue Cross, we, the city purchases it from them. So anything under $150,000 per individual per year is the city's responsibility. Anything over $150,000 is Blue Cross's responsibility. We've transferred that risk to them for a premium. And then we have a worst case scenario called uh, aggregate stop loss. The worst case scenario, what is the worst case? We have a number, we know what the worst case is. We've not hit it. So we're in good shape there. But it's there for, it's very inexpensive. Uh, but it's really good just to have for budgeting purposes for worst case. But what you get into when you start self-funding, it's the changes are, are a little bit more uh, cumbersome to make changes. You can do it. It's not like you have to be married with Blue Cross of Kansas. But in a minute, we're going to talk about a lag report. Because remember, when you go on today for your services, when do you get your bill? going to be a few more weeks down the road. You'll get that explanation of benefits after the provider discounts it, and then you'll have to apply your deductible or copay or whatever to it. So it takes a while to get that generated. Now, the beautiful part about this in a minute, I've talked about the lag report, the electronic filing from providers has gotten much more common. So that period, that lag period, from when it was services rendered when paid, has shortened quite a bit over the years, which helps in reserve funding uh, discussions. Um, Stop loss, again, we've talked about that on an individual basis. They call it specific or individual stop loss and aggregate, which is the most in a policy period. And remember, we're going to talk about some of the technical technicalities of it, incurred versus paid, reimbursement methods. And the reimbursement method is probably the most important method. With carrier-based programs, and I'll pick on Cigna, I'll pick on Aetna, I'll pick on Blue Cross. When you typically buy a stop loss program from the insurance carrier, when you hit that 150000 per individual in any one given year, they take it from that point forward. On If you carve that out, you, there are separate insurers that will do that. Sun Life is one, Gerber Life, you know the baby people, they have an insurance program. Um, what happens is you pay anything above that and then they send you a check back. It's a reimbursement model. I don't like that because some of these claims can get big. And so therefore, I prefer a carrier-based model. It doesn't mean you can't. But also carrier-based models, typically what they do, they call those, they call them pooled rated. They pool all their stuff together. So your claims don't directly impact you all the time, where if you carve that out to a stop-loss carrier, 
your rates could vary every year based on who's sick. <laughs> so sometimes it's you pay a little bit more carrier based than you will carving it out. Why? Because there's a benefit plus or minus to that. Provider net networks, uh, the big deal right now is called narrow networks, uh, trying to narrow the, the utilization down. Uh, you may remember years ago called the health maintenance organizations, HMOs, whether well, there's affordable care uh, organizations, ACOs that have, that have been developed, accountable care organizations, excuse me, uh, which are trying to narrow network those people down. And of course, there's winners and losers in all provider network discounts. Sometimes a physician gets narrowed down in their reimbursement model. Um, so you have to find out where that sweet house is, or what's realistic and what's not. Uh, last I checked, providers just getting Medicare payment do not stay in business very long. They have to have some other income to be able to afford all, um, keeping their doors open. Rx rebates, we're going to talk about it real quickly. Uh, Rx is probably, that's why I said good, bad, and ugly. Um, it, it's a shell game almost. It's really difficult to understand how it all works. Uh, the city is with MedTrack. It's a pharmacy benefit manager. It's carved out from Blue Cross. We've done that for a reason over the years. Uh, they've managed the claims extremely well. We supplement that with Tria Healthcare, which actually contacts the individuals, make sure they're com in compliance with their medications. We've seen a very good return on investments on that for the city and their employees. The employees have embraced it. Uh, and then the city also gets some rebates uh, from MedTrack. Of course, the cost of MedTrack is very little money. Why? Because they're still getting part of the rebates. So it's where do you want it? You want all the rebates and you gotta pay more elsewhere for somebody to handle it. And of course, care and case management, those that have needs, how can we expand that to manage those? Did you say um, that the city does get the Blue Cross Blue Shield negotiated rates? Yes, we do. That's a big plus. It's a big plus. Yeah. Yeah, as the carrier models have not gotten that ag aggressive and then WPPA, they've changed their name now to doctors, or doctors, I'm gonna get it wrong, I better not say it. Um, fine provider network, uh, but the discounts aren't quite what Blue Cross of Kansas discounts are. Uh, this is a kind of a, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, just kind of a snapshot summary. Where's our money go as a city? So I wanted to kind of let you see kind of in the, in the scheme of it all where we're sitting at from 2-1-2019 to 131 of 2020, which is your, the city's contract year. And as you can see, all the little pieces down there, the Papaka taxes, about $3,600 a year, not horrible, uh, because some of those fees went away uh, years, a couple years ago. The individual and aggregate stop loss, remember stopping at 150 and uh, aggregate at 130% The city pays about $600,000 for that currently. It's not cheap. Claims administration, about $211,000 a year for Blue Cross to manage all your claims and about $4,000 for MedTrack to manage your pharmacy clients. So collectively, up in the green, it's about 10.9% of your overall spend is spent on fixed costs. Things we know we're gonna pay out. Somebody to handle it, somebody to help enroll it, somebody to manage claims and pay the claims and provide stop loss protection. Above that, we have MedTrack, which with TRIA management, we put that in there. It's about a million and a half dollars a year in claims, about 20% of the overall spend. That is about right. I find in higher education and K through 12, that spends about 25%. So that is the wild card right now, a little bit, the pharmacy cost. But the city is running about 20% of your overall cost is in pharmacy costs. And then you can see the medical claims, it's at, <coughs> it caps at 150,000 for any one individual. And the city is right on track to be right at $3.9 million this year. And you're almost like clockwork. You're right on track. If you took the, the claims that Natalie provides me every month and the report I get from Blue Cross of Kansas every month, if you analyze it, you're right on track. And don't be surprised, we have claims that are up and down. But we've also got 503 employees plus families that help spread that risk. The important piece also to see is that the reserve fund, when, when Natalie and I visit every year, uh, you know, a lot of people don't have reserve funds for to manage those debt years that go up, up and down, because you can almost bank on it every four years, you're gonna have a rough year. 
just write it down. You're going to have it. Um, so there's that corridor, and that's why we want you to have some reserve dollars. And the city has done a really nice job in reserve dollars. So that would take care of any fluctuation during the year, as well as if you ever decide to leave Blue Cross, you still are <coughs> responsible for those claims that were when you were Blue Cross. Something new would start, and it would be immature. It would start at zero. Uh, so you just need to keep those dollars available. So that's what it looks like as we sit today. Now this question? is question. Yes. Five hundred and three employees, aren't we? Is that the retired that's employees? That that's enrolled in the plan. Okay. That would include everybody. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the reserve fund, uh -huh. you're showing like the basically almost one point two million. Uh -huh. Is that where you'd like to see it? That's where I think the minimum should be. Okay. And because we had decided like not to fund it this year, right? And we're at what this year? Well we talked about one point five. Right. We funded it. We identified that we were in excess of our target right. reserve balance, so right. we we stopped making those payments through the end of the calendar year. So the reserve balance will stay where it was, and which is in excess of our target, mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll pick back up in our one. And then we'll decide next year. We'll look at it again towards the end of the year. I would right. anticipate. And what was our target? One point five, two. So one point. That's about one point five. Yeah. Okay. This is the we risk. Conversations anyone, that up slightly because I thought we bumped it to right. two. Yeah, it might I, be. I, I, yeah, I think I we. Like I think we personally. Yeah. I think we. <coughs> one point five is what you suggested, but I think we bumped it to yeah, two. That's fine. Okay. Again, this is a, this is just one year. Yeah. You know, so you if you have a bad year, you can whack that away pretty quickly. So I have no problem with where they're at. Yeah. But I always get that question: How much should we have in there? Right. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> but here's. Here's, uh, I've already gotten your renewals. I just got them last week. Uh, now I don't think Natalie's even seen them because uh, my job is to go back and, and have a discussion with Blue Cross uh, when I see their information. Um, and it, you, you'll notice a couple things. I'm going to go back and forth real quick here. It's on your slide, but if you look at the stop loss, it's $595,000 this period at renewal, 478. Excellent. Your experience is good, and Blue Cross collectively has done well. Your fixed fees have stayed almost flat, as have the other taxes. Uh, again, you can see the overall cost at 9.01% versus the 10.9% that was earlier. So your fixed fees have come down. Excellent news. The expected medical claims have gone up slightly. I actually increased both 8% based on my Ouija board, uh, and let me tell you how my Ouija board works. Uh, I carve out both medical and pharmacy as just like we have here. And when I take the city's specific claims, and I look at where people are going and what the discounts look like, and it's been very, very, uh, I won't say simplistic, but it's been very, um, I won't say even predictable, but it's, it's fairly consistent. So very, I got a great comfort level with that. What we're seeing right now is in the medical cost, about 4%, 4.5% medical trend cost increases every year, which is pretty good. That is utilization as well as cost of service going up. Pharmacy is the wild card. It's between 9 and 11. Demand depends on specialty drugs, uh, et cetera. So that's, that's the concern. So just for ease of understanding, I, the, the, the funding level, that I come up with is just my my number. If you took 20% of, of your cost um, being the, the pharmacy and you took 80% of medical at 4.5 or it's, it's probably closer to seven. I used 8% just for discussion purposes. So as you can see, you can kind of see where the funding is going forward. But to me at this point where we're talking where my challenge has been with Blue Cross and they give us expected claim numbers, and that's where those numbers come from as well. Uh, to me, my heavy negotiating items are really in the fixed cost area. Because the claims are your claims. I can't do a whole lot about that. But I can have an impact on your fixed cost. And so I'm really happy with what the renewal looks like so far this year. So where do we lose the 12 employees at? Read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. these are these are just employees who've chosen to that is correct. sign up for. I mean, like if their spouse has coverage, they may not right. need ours. Well, it's a snapshot in time. This time last year was five hundred three. This month it was four ninety one. Our our employment levels fluctuate that much yeah. month 
month, uh, just depending on you know departmental activities. Um, and I'll just add, and with um, sometimes even because the retirees would be included in there. Oh, they right. age off. They they could turn 65 and no longer be eligible for other coverage. So it's okay. yeah, like Mike said, it fluctuates month to month. Wasn't sure what age off was going to refer to, but I, I like the choice you chose. <laughs> <laughs> they have a term. <laughs> yeah, when I see that, I'm going, I don't know what that means. Uh, but yeah, that, uh, after, obviously, if they're active, they work, and they can be older age 65. That's not an issue. But once they retire, it, it does terminate at the age 65. Medicare eligible. Uh, this is really uh, this is going to be too much for you right now, but I just kind of want to show you that say well just give you some stop loss protection. Um, my re response is what kind of stop loss you want, <laughs> and you're going to go oh my gosh I can't believe you just did that. And, well if you look at this under the 1212 contract, think of it in the blue line is incurred and paid. It's incurred in 12 and paid in 12. It's a short period of time. Services have to be rendered and then paid within that contract period. So what's that mean? Well it's going to be cheap. It's, because it's not going to take any what we call running claims at 2412. Anything that happened 12 months before but not paid until after the contract, it's covered. If I was on the 1212, if service was rendered in January, it did not count to next year's contract. Obviously, it's going to be cheaper that way. So, obviously, there's all kinds of plans to look at as we do, do here. Uh, Blue Cross is on an incurred basis, so whenever the service is rendered, it doesn't matter when it's paid. It goes to that stop loss contract. So that's probably one of the more expensive ones to get. However, if you ever change, it's a great contract to have. Because that way, if you have somebody that happens to go in for a heart issue in December and doesn't get paid to March, April, or whatever, fine, it still goes against that 150,000 stop loss at which services are rendered. So those are usually the, you pay a little bit more for that, a little bit of premium for that, but uh, it's really good. We have a lot of contracts that are just paid just whenever I pay a write a check, I want to go against my clients. That's fine until you want to change. <coughs> you don't have to worry about that extended, that terminal period, that lag period, if you will. And here's what a lag report looks like. Again, I'm all about charts and fun stuff. What I've done here is just so you can see the life of a claim. <coughs> Excuse me, this is back in 2011, same kind of, I just, it was something simple I just pulled up. So services were rendered in July of 2011 and paid in 2011, 105000 In In August of 2011, they paid another 168000 for claims that have happened in July of 2011. Then 13 and 6 and 3, then got a little refund after that. In other words, just because you, you have a claim in one month doesn't mean you're done self-funding. You still have what we call terminal liability, those runoff claims, if you will. And on average, and this is pretty consistent across the board of which I work, services rendered and paid in that first month, 40% is paid. Service rendered and paid. It's pretty good. <clears throat> Second month, almost 90% of that is paid. So when we talk about reserve funds and terminal liabilities, you know. Well, you have to add all those months up. But after the second or third month, the, the dollars are really small. Now, I've seen some weird ones come in after the fact, six, seven months after the fact. Usually nothing over a year. Anything over a year, I, I uh, challenge. Because a provider or Blue Cross or somebody messed something up. I make them go back to the stop loss if I can get it. But this way you can kind of see when you make changes, it's just not, okay, we're going to go A to A, B. Well, we still have some responsibilities from where we were. Doesn't mean we can't address them. You just need to be aware of them. Employee contributions. Uh, this is just a FYI slide. Uh, the key for 2020 uh, under the Affordable Care Act, uh, under the affordab affordability rules, uh, the employee cannot spend over 9.78% of their income for their health insurance. And so when the city has contribution discussions about, we want our employees to pay $200 a month for this, you have to kind of work it backwards. What's our lowest paid employee, eligible employee, times 30 hours a week, times 9.78%, what is that safe harbor amount? If, it's, if they have to pay if over that, 
you as an entity can be fined by the federal government. So this is something Natalie and I watch out for every year. This is great shape on that. Uh, it's actually down a little bit for 2019. It's actually 9.86 percent. So they're actually ratcheting it down a little bit. The affordability provisions. Rule of thumb is if the employee pays over 100 and I'm gonna get it wrong, but about 100 dollars a month. Rule of thumb for their single lowest cost single plan. You just need to double check and make sure you're not going to be in violation of any affordability rules. How many tiers? So this is a fun one. Uh, we have some with employee, employed spouse, employed child, employee and children, so that's one or more children, then family. Uh, a lot of people looking at five tiers. Uh, that makes it kind of cumbersome, but it makes it pretty handy for the employee to decide where, you know, based on what the city contributes for. But I'm going to tell you right now, at the end of the year, this city still needs $6 million to pay your claims. I don't care how I get it. Okay? So, you can make seven tiers if you want, but I still need $6 million to pay claims. So sometimes it really helps in, in helping attract talent um, and maintain uh, the employee base. Now that I've talked about this, but it's just an FYI for you as, <coughs> as we look forward. Uh, we actually have, yeah. Recently modified that, right? Yeah, a couple years ago when we added yeah, yeah, tier. We actually just add a plus one. We don't mm -hmm. carve it out. <coughs> um, child. child versus spouse. We just split it in the middle and call it a plus one. Yeah, some people will do, this is a, a ballpark employee rate, whatever it's set at. You know, employee and spouse rate is usually two times, because generally they're close to the same age, and it always been generally. Employee and child is going to be about 1.75 times the single rate. Children's going to be a little bit. Family's about three and a half to four per, four times single rate. We try to keep it around three and a half. So just that's just a kind of a barometer where, where, you, where you want to try and see rates if you can get it that way. We have some higher universities, higher ed folks that like to modify based on employee pay. We actually also have a hospital that does this. Uh, they set tiers, tier one, two, and three, which is not the same as the tiers before, but it's payroll tier. So if you if you get paid less than, I'm going to throw a number out, uh, $40,000 a year, uh, you pay, you know, 5% of the single rate. If you make between forty and 60000 you pay 8% of the single rate. If you make over that, you make 10% of the single rate. That would help those in lower pay to help make you afford this plan a little bit easier. Pretty common in high education. Don't see a lot in public entities, but I just want to let you know it's out there. And we do do that, or we don't? We don't we do, do not. We do not. We do not. Do the, tiers. the highest tier still has to have safe harbor? Yes, I do. But it's only on an employee rate. Right. So, uh, high deductible, uh, qualified high deductible plans. Um, you don't have that right now. Uh, just This was the Ken, uh, Kaiser Family Foundation. I don't know why they haven't updated this, but 2013 is the last one I could pull up real quickly. The 20 percent of covered uh, workers have a qualified high deductible plan. I personally have one. I like it. Um, some people are very nervous about it, and here's how it works. You can forget deductibles. You can forget co. Well, if you, if you have deductibles, there's no co-insurance. There's usually no co-pays. None of that stuff. What it is is that you pay 100 percent of all your health care up to a certain dollar. And it's usually $2,800 for a single, $5,600 for a family. And then the plan pays 100%. So, but I also get to create a health savings account in my name, which is my account, my money, and my bank. So I can build essentially a health IRA for my retirement years. That's why I like it. So, but for younger families, it scares them to death. Because what's the biggest question? How much does it cost? How much does a physician cost? You can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, is that it, it's, the, some of that information is not as transparent as we would like it for it to be. And we have seen over the years, and I actually had this happen to me, and I had money in my health savings account. The question was, do I go to the ER, do I wait till tomorrow and, and visit with my physician? I should never have to answer that question. That was a stupid question for me to ask. So I went to the ER. That was, you know, thirty-five hundred bucks. I'm fine now, but be that as may, it was a peace of mind to me to do that. I should have never had to ask the question. 
So that's the challenges with qualified. And oh, by the way, it puts hospitals in the, in the, in the collection capacity. They just love that. So um, good news, bad news of high deductible health plans. Uh, just as I, I actually went to a seminar last week, um, you know, it's interesting when you look at the, the trend charts of a, let's say a $500 deductible plan, or a thousand is, is more common today, and a high deductible plan, which is a $2,800 deductible. You see the premium differences right here. But historically, the trend is the same. <laughs> so really, well, the only difference is the deductible. The hope of this was the trend would leveled out and it hasn't been that way at all. So it's, it's been a pretty interesting discussion as to is it, has they been uh, good or not. Uh, this is just information from the Kaiser Family Foundation that I pulled up for 2018. The average cost of coverage, $71.50 for a single, $20,000 for a family. Uh, employees pay usually 18% of the single rate, and you're gonna say, wait a minute, what about that 9.78% rule? Well. That's of the single rate, the 9.78 is of their pay. Not of the premium, that's of their pay. Average deductibles, 1,573 bucks. Anything about the city's plan, you've got a share pay plan, which functions a little bit like a high deductible, but at least you're not paying all of it. You still have to ask the question, how much does it cost? Should I take a different drug, should I not? Because part of that's on me. That's a good, that's, 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 that's a good consumer discussion. Um, but at least they've got an immediate benefit as well. I really like the share pay concept that you've got. Uh, defined contributions. Uh, you may remember that several years ago, this was the buzzword. Employee, all the, the employer has to do is say, I'm going to give everybody 500 bucks. Go knock yourself out. Here's my plans. Pick and choose the one you want. I don't care. Because it doesn't matter to me as the employer which you take. It's 500 bucks. You want it in cash, take it in cash. I don't care. Well, if you look at the very bottom here, the opinion, my opinion, the, the key success was in national programs. Walgreens, UPS, United States Postal Service, Arby's, Bob Evans, Domino's, Darden, which is the restaurant group, they all adopted that. Why'd they adopt that? Turn over. In and out, in and out. Just here it is, which one you want, leave me alone. Hasn't been very um, effective anywhere else that I have seen. But essentially, the point of fix the pan, plan, or replace a flat contribution. It's really budget focused, but it hasn't been very HR friendly from what we've seen, and they're rarely talked about anymore. Uh, wellness activities, um, biometric screenings, and health risk assessment programs. How much do you encourage participation? Usually, it's a dollar amount. Uh, it's a dollar amount that you have to pay more if you don't participate or you don't get your finger prick or you don't do your health risk assessment or whatever. Uh, I know my wife works if I was was on her plan for years until a couple years ago and I had to participate too in order to get the premium discount otherwise I would have to pay through her check. So it was if the spouse has participated I had to qualify as well. Okay. Um, to me it's a snapshot in time it is not doesn't take place a senior position. Um, the bottom the comment is pretty interesting. We've had a lot of employers suspended because the EEOC is getting ready to rule on that regarding the ADA. I think it will be fine, but there are some provisions in there, especially regarding outcomes-based. You have to meet certain cholesterol requirements or whatever in order to get it. I think that's gone down to metal in a little bit too much, and I think the EEOC is going to step in and say, yeah, I can do that. But I think they will continue to allow if you want to do biometric screenings, health risk assessments. We had one school district last year says, you know, we're not doing that anymore. However, to get your premium differential, you've got to see your primary care physician. I don't need the results. I, here's the form. It says, I attended and signed. That's it. It's a yes or no. It's a checkbox. Very good encouragement. I kind of like that one. But wellness based activities are going to be interesting going forward. Uh, community based plans. This is kind of the the, a lot of discussion points we're starting to see. I work out in western Kansas a lot too. And you know the challenge has been and is, you know, how about the city and the county and the school and the community college and the hospital all hold hands and sing kubaya. And you know, I was here probably six, seven years ago, I might be updating myself, and I 
had a discussion with the city and the county about joining and developing a trust together. Um, it's like everything, it was like, well, are we, are we saving any money? No, you're just kind of making your group bigger. You know, and it kind of takes a decision making away from you and from them. So it was a good discussion to have. Um, hospitals, I think, are going to like it in certain areas because that way they can steer more of their folk there. Well, of course, my response is, well, how much leakage are they really having? And does the hospital provide all the services that are needed for that community already? We had one out in central Missouri that they were trying to get going and never did get going, but the hospital really wanted to play ball because they thought, if I can get more utilization here, I can, get a, I can get a cat lab. I can get cardiologists on staff. That's how they were thinking. I thought it was pretty brilliant. But they were too close to Kansas City, so we'll just send them to St. Louis. And so it just it didn't quite go like we wanted to, that discussion to go. But you know, like everything else, we need we need to talk about provider discounts and steerage. Who's giving up what? Is the hospital going to have to give up five percent more discounts to get you to come here? Because you're going to have to modify your plan. Say, hey, if you go to this hospital or to this physician, we'll waive your copay. <coughs> cool. Somebody's still going to pay for that service. <laughs> so. I think it can be have some good discussions to have. Uh, we're starting to see some reference-based pricing models show up. Forget the provider network. We'll negotiate all those discounts for you. You know, they'll, they'll say, well, we're going to pay all the physicians Medicare plus 180 times 180%. I don't know if that's good or not. You know, it might be great. It, but will the provider accept it? And if the provider doesn't accept it, can they bill my employee for the difference? Yes, because there's no contract. So there's just some things you need to talk about. They have some good uh, reference points. Uh, we have a deal in, um, <clears throat> in Oklahoma City. They have outpatient surgery now. Uh, they have a schedule of what they do, and there's the price for it. And oh, by the way, you better bring a check with you. Well, they're not, they're not going to file insurance for you. You can file it, but they're not. Kind of like direct primary care physicians, which is really hot and warm right now. Everything goes there. They don't file claims. You pay 50 bucks per employee per month, or and they'll take care of you, no matter how many business you have. Kind of like an HMO of old, is it not? The, the concierge medicine mm -hmm. style. Yeah. Yeah, they, they can have some great uh, outcomes. I think I really do because people are engaged. Um, so it's 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 just an interesting dynamic that we're in today. And where it lands, we don't really know. Um, you know, when you look at some of these, I said probably need to use a TPA, which is a third-party administrator. And what that is, there's one great band called uh, BMI. There's another one out there called Freedom as well. Uh, and off, the lady used to work there, started her own. Uh, some in one in Joplin, one in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, some up north. Uh, Maritain's in uh, Kansas City. Maritain happens to be owned by Edna. Uh, UMR, which has you know by United Healthcare. I mean, there's there's some interesting dilemmas that are going on in our, in our industry. Uh, but you need to have somebody that understands those provider discounts, understands how to pay claims, and your your employees are comfortable with using them as as a source when they go see a physician. Um, again, we talked about steerage to the local hospitals already, and what their leakage is to other medical facilities. Just as an FYI, I was down in southeast Kansas working with a hospital client today still, and we brought a lot of the large employers in town uh, to a meeting with a hospital administrator, and I was able to get some data from the, from the large employers on a confidential basis, because I'm going, well, hospital, do you, do you give them a cash discount if they, you know, if they come here? I mean, I don't know. Well, they were getting almost 75% of all the care already. <laughs> so. I, you know, just knock five percent off because you're already getting them. I, why would you do that? So you know, just an interesting discussion to have about that concentric model, the community-based plan. Um, and so we're having those discussions still. But to me, I think a lot of the hospital issues are that we're starting to see it, in not only in ER but off-hours clinic support. If you can find local clinics that'll have extended hours or weekend hours, that's where where the savings is going to be in the future. Gets them out of the ER. Uh, pools, um, you need to know about this. Uh, they call them associational trusts. There's actually an agreement that was, was there. 
I call it Hotel California. You can check in any time you like. You can never leave. Remember that song from the Eagles? Um, actually, you can leave, but it's, it's a challenge. Uh, most of them did not give you any loss information. Why? Because you're holding hands as a, as a pool. <coughs> we rate it. We may give you a loss ratio, which tells you how much you paid in and how much they paid out. But that doesn't give you an idea. So getting out is very difficult because most insurers want to know your census and your claim data. If you don't have claim data, how do you get out? And of course, when you join one, you know, the board makes the decision, the board of the trust, not the entity itself. So your eye, your decision is, do we remain or do we not? Well, we wanted to, you, you didn't understand. You either stay or you don't. <laughs> These are the rates. So a lot of uh, entities, smaller entities, especially like these, because it, it's, a, it's a true, it's almost like fully insured. They handle it all for you. And you're with a bigger group of like-minded people. So sometimes it can really be a, a, a very good barometer. Groups your size, probably not. <clears throat> Again, terminal liabilities, we talked about this just a little ago, that lag report. A lot of them have those provisions. Uh, you have to give them 90 days notice. Um, if you don't leave, there's a penalty to stay. Uh, we have one uh, that you could actually qualify for there in Kansas as well. If you leave after the 90th day, anything that's not paid is your responsibility. And you're going to go, okay, so what do my claims look like? Oh, you don't understand. I don't give you claim data. So what am I accepting? You're accepting all payments after 90 days. How much? Don't know. Guess we're going to find out. I just, that really makes me nervous to do that. And if you leave, you can't get back in for three years. They don't want public entities getting in and getting out, getting in and getting out, getting out for stuff. Um, going forward for you all as a city, um, you know, I've got all the timeline here in just a second, but in, in a summary, it's enrollment. This, I work everything backwards. When's the enrollment need to be done? So when does the commission need to make some decisions? Do we need to do interviews, evaluations? We need to market it, get the questions, develop the RFP, get some fact-finding, establish some goals early on. Typically, 120 days prior to renewal is what we like to get. Historically, we get the city's information from Blue Cross of Kansas in early September. Like I said, we've gotten that already. Uh, Possible, these are just some ideas. I'm not telling you to do this or not do this, but I've seen this with other public entities. Uh, some say, you know, management, we want you to mark this every five years. It's an annual agreement. Nothing is multi-year. Number one, I'm sure I'm not gonna give you multi-year. But number two, you don't need to give them one either. But if it goes, that's why I look at this in September. If it looks up, we need to make a decision. But you know, some say, well, every five years, just go ahead and do a due diligence and truly market this thing. Let's get a quote from Daniel. Let's get one from, from Cigna. Let's get, you know, what do we want to look at? Uh, some ask for due diligence review uh, for trends, fundings, et cetera, every three years. I actually do this for a large group in, this, in the state of Missouri. Uh, it's not really marketing. Uh, I go through and I do a little bit deeper dive into your annual reports. Uh, although our firm right now does annual report reviews of your claims. I keep track of it every month. Um, I don't do a whole lot beyond that uh, because we charge to market stuff like that. But um, you know, at least I think from our point of view as a city as we sit today, we do look at this area to see if there's any swings and things we need to look at or, or worry about. But sometimes we have people say every five years I want you to actually bid it, fine. Uh, you're, you're the boss, so you all make those decisions. Um, this is kind of our dog. We don't have a plug. My sister has a plug. We have a um, obstacles. These are just FYIs. Um, number four, bigger is not always cheaper. We talked about that. It's more predictable. Uh, every entity has its own goals and decisions. Uh, just because you're a city doesn't make you the same as as Hutchison or Hayes or anybody else. Um, healthcare alignment. You got to watch your funding schemes. More patient centered medical homes. Centers of excellence. Blue Cross of Kansas is doing that now. They're charging for it as well. Um, better outcomes uh, is usually less money, even though the cost of care may be greater. So they're focusing more and more on that, which I think is a good thing. Um, obstacle two, uh, what's the main issue, folks? I think the main issue is disease. Um, the group called Livongo, Nashville Slim, and others. Nashville Slim offices is a weight loss. Livongo is disease uh, diabetes management. Um, those are becoming more and more prevalent. 
So in other words, there's two things to talk about. There's the assumption risk transfer of the benefit plan, and then what can we do to help our employees get better? And that's the disease piece. And sometimes the carriers don't always do what they, we want them to do. So that's why the city's done TRIA on the RX side, better manage that. There's other programs out there for disease management. Control the disease, you're gonna control your costs. Of course, plan designs, we've talked about plan designs already. But again, trend data shows there on the same projections of PPL plans. I did that backwards on purpose. So, uh, okay, now Natalie, I thought I had this in here, but I don't see it. Uh, did I not put a timetable for you? I did. That one? Okay, it was in a, the one I sent the day after that one. I actually have a timetable put together that outlines is what I talked about earlier. Um, I can just can let you see that. Yeah, you want to run a cup of coffee? Yeah, I'll be fine. I'm sorry, I thought that was in the last deal I sent you. That kind of gives you an idea from my perspective. You know, working backwards, we talked about a minute ago, kind of gives you an idea of the timeline to do that. And uh, so if you wanted to look at something for 2-1, the time to start is now. When did we last go to market and do you any know, kind of analysis? Um, it's probably been, I'm going to get this wrong. I don't have, probably five years, because we, we looked for other alternatives. Um, and I think it was trying to make some inroads into the hospital. Okay. But I haven't done it since. Can you tell <coughs> underutilization be a problem when the premium starts approaching a certain percentage of annual income? Because I could see a person, if, if there's no way in the world they can realistically fork out 3500 a year for the family, that their option may be, well, just won't go at all. Mm -hmm. That's why. That's why the employer contrib employer contribution is so critical. If you look at this city, the employer contribution is, is good. It's very good. And I don't know your school district here, but most K through 12 that we work with, the they pay the the single rate of the lowest cost plan, and the employee pays the entire difference to their family, and that can get quite expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. Counties are similar to you. You pay a, a large block of single and, the, and some of the family rate. And so it encourages that participation. Um, I, I want more members in there because, again, it, it makes it more predictable for me. Uh, if I see a bunch of single only and no families, I get, I mean, at number one, it tells me how the contributions work. Um, but it, it, it makes me worry about who, who gets in and who gets out at open enrollment because then they'll stay out, then they'll get back in an open enrollment when something bad's gonna happen, or they think something's going on. So, you can be adversely selecting against yourself if you don't encourage people to stay on the plane. Makes sense. And, uh, what, is there a dollar amount? All right, what's the dollar amount that triggers involvement in wellness activities? $50 a month. That's the rule of thumb. So, um, and the reason I ask, I should be embarrassed to say this, but uh, this, I, I, yeah, we have it at the hospital, but I was what you call probably a slacking participant. Um, and this year, I just switched to my, my uh, wife insurance completely. I said, oh, good, I want to do these wellness things again. But uh, it's a lot of work, plus, I guess that cynical part that says, well, I don't want all this information about me residing with my employer. And I think they couldn't just go open up my x ray. <laughs> I don't want to look at it anymore. Anyway, well, but, but well, that's a good observation. Um, that's why usually it's third parties that do the wellness screenings and not the carrier or the employer. So in other words, the, the employer just gets global data 
we had 400 people attend. We had 12 people that you know had high diabetes numbers. We had this obesity number. So it's it's a global number, but that individual data never comes back to the city or any public entity, or any entity for that fact. Mm -hmm. Number one, if they did, it would be a violation of HIPAA. Right. And I'm not going to jail for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so that's number one. But yeah, that is a, that's a common concern. And the insurance carrier can't get that information either because they can't discriminate on who's accepted or not anyway. So it would serve them no purpose. And oh, by the way, the yeah, insurer's already got your claim data. <laughs> so, you know, it, but even then they can't, the only time that becomes a concern for me is not for the employee, it's for the employer. When we talked about uh, um, specific stop loss, when you carve that out to a care for a, a I'm going to pick on Sun Life, they don't, I'm not meaning to pick on them, again, they don't really do this, but uh, a lot of carriers will say, okay, Charles, with you've got a heart disease, you've had this, you've had this, you've got pre-cancer here. Instead of 150,000, we're going to laser you at 250,000 for the city. So the city's going to be responsible for the first 250,000. My response is, well, you've had me all this time, and now I'm having a bad, doesn't matter, a new contract period. The Blue Cross doesn't do that. They pool it. So again, it gets back to Sometimes large claims can have an impact on self-funding, depending on how you carve that out. So, but yeah, the individual information on large claims, they'll ask for notes regarding that for the underwriter, which they can't under business associate agreement because it impacts the pricing of the model. So yeah, that impression can be found, but usually it's all encrypted. I don't get names. I never get a name. I've seen the pharmacy program work. That so with this mm -hmm. one with ones that come in through the office and a lot of the suggestions are are good. Sometimes you can tell a computer probably generated the question and probably it didn't quite understand why it was using the medication. But I would say those probably are worth their cost. I Either think they are. To me, it's about understanding and make sure we're on the same page. Um, and the wellness is there data to prove that the wellness programs. That data has proved that the ROI is, I think, three to one on that program. What the yep. city does, it's quite good. Uh, now, of course, you got to, and I don't, I don't look at ROI as being absenteeism or presenteeism or any of that other stuff. I look at pure dollars. Based on this, they were available, to, they were able to not get into this category, which, based on your claims, is three thousand dollars an episode. So we're able to, because of this, we saved this. So it is specific to the city. Yeah, it's not some global number out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one's worked out well. And it's some work on the city, and it's some work on the employees' part. But yeah, the, they will have that, that discussion with their physician, which is what we want. Okay, that was a lot to cram in real quick. <laughs> I feel like I should put in for CME credit for this. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of cut off questions prematurely. So, what's um, the next step? I mean, um, I guess you need some direction for <coughs> whether or not are we prefer to go out for bid, and then, like, what about the, <coughs> the due diligence review that you mentioned? Doing that every three years? Uh, I actually I looked at that almost every year. Anyway. Okay, okay, so that's something that you do in yeah. proper. Okay, all right. So yeah, now if you want a formal something. due diligence, where I get in and get. Claim data that's really detailed, and sometimes I'll have to pay. Uh, the city's going to have to pay to get data sent to a, um, a firm to analyze, analyze. that. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's ten thousand dollars to do right. that. So I, right. again, what's my benefit of that? Right. I think Blue Cross gives me enough information to see where we're going, what we're looking at. Okay. There's a few things I still want to know this year from Blue Cross. Uh, I. I Tell you right now, I think the fixed cost they provided is very good. Mm -hmm. right. I have no problem with it whatsoever for one one of or two one of 2020. Right. I'm perfectly happy with it personally. Right. Um, I think I want to look at uh, the pharmacies doing well. Mm -hmm. I want to look at their contracts a little bit deeper this next year, actually before the renewal, and I can do that this month. It's nothing that takes your your time. Uh, we may want to talk about where the rebates are more specifically. We want to talk about which formula are we going to look at regarding use of drugs. 
that really isn't an impact on the commissioners here. But I think it's part of my job to are we getting the, the right program for your employees and the city? Make sure we're controlling our cost. Do we automatically renew with Blue Cross if we don't? Well, <laughs> yeah, in all honesty, what I wanted to avoid is to come to you with, and we need we need your authorization to renew, and you really don't have an, another option but to renew, or we'd be out of coverage. So I'm trying to, to identify that date and that time and this timeline to at least provide that option. But um, now or very shortly hereafter would be the, the time to decide whether we're going to go to market or whether we're going to prep negotiate for renewal of Blue Cross Blue Shield. And there's nothing on the horizon that's going to juggle our... <clears throat> not that I've seen right now. That, that may juggle parameters. If the hospital comes up with a creative idea, I'd like to hear about it. Um, but as I sit here today, I haven't seen anything that says, this is where you really have to go right now as a city. I'm not saying that. Do companies like Blue Cross tend to come back with a better offer when they know they're competing, or figure you know, well, it's a level playing field of all of us? Let's see if we can't float everybody's boat up. We've been customers a long time. That, that's a good question. Um, we work with Blue Cross, uh, let me put it this way Blue Cross tolerates men. Um, I don't get commissions, I don't care if you stay with them or not. Um, so, you know, my issue is, are you providing the best for my client? And I work with a lot of other different reps across the state. So I see other public entities as well as the city of Salina. So I have an idea what to expect from them. Um, their actuaries insulted me more than once, and I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, so, but we're usually pretty close at the end of the day. Um, the question is, are they providing the services that the city needs or not, and your employees need or not? And to me, that's probably the biggest question. And then they've had some changes regarding their uh, patient center medical home programs. Uh, that was kind of a, uh, an, an added cost to the city. Well, I want to see those results. Well, they're just implemented, so I haven't seen results yet. But, you know, if we get these in September, I like the idea of getting the numbers in September, early September. And that way we can have this discussion every year. This looks ugly. Well, let's find out what else is out there. Mm -hmm. I like that approach personally. But every five, I don't care, you're the boss. Um, that's usually not within my normal scope of duties for the city. It's usually a separate cost for me to do that. So basically you're, you're comfortable with our fixed costs. In fact, part of it came down, if we go back to that one screen. Mm -hmm. As far as what's best for the employee, the negotiated rates with Blue Cross Blue Shield are usually, you know, fairly advantageous, I would say, for the employee. Are any of the other companies that you represent, or that you would have, do they come close to that, or? As far oh, they'll, as they, they'll all be fairly they'll close. They'll be fairly close uh -huh. on the negotiated rates. Yeah. We're finding, um, the last I did a deep, deep dig down, and I could be off today, but the other provider discounts are fairly comparable to Blue Cross of Kansas. I don't see any that are less than. Doesn't mean they can't meet it. Uh, I think if you did more direct contracting or, or maybe some of the uh, uh, reference-based pricing models, you might be able to beat their pricing, but then you're going to have disruption on the other end with your employees. So to me, it's, it's, it's almost a teeter-totter balance effect at that point. I guess this would be a question for Natalie. How do you feel our employees feel about their current health care coverage? Um, you know, I don't hear from a lot of them. Jennifer probably hears more than I do. But when individuals have been in that <coughs> circumstance to need it, that's when they are definitely recognizing the value and the benefit. Um, so I guess it's a good thing that they can take it for granted that it's there to cover them. But, I mean, in terms of claims not being covered or having major issues, we don't have a lot of that at all. It's, uh, you know, I'll turn to Jennifer if she has anything to add because she handles it. She's our benefits coordinator. Um, but rarely do, does it get to me because it isn't something that's easily resolved. 
I would agree with that. They're used to things being taken care of with very little hassle. And then the few things we run across are resolved quickly, normally. So yeah. yeah we probably haven't had the situation here for a while since we've been with the same Blue Cross. But in a self-insured model, if the insurer changes, are there rules for preventing prior condition exclusions? There will be no pre-existing issues on a takeover, no. That's, okay. Now, it doesn't mean a new carrier would not try to laser somebody on their stop loss that will impact the city funding. That's all I can, I mean, I don't know. We'd have to provide, we have to provide a census data, we have to, which will apply, which so that we can get average age and stuff like that. Um, we'll uh, provide the monthly enrollment and monthly claim payments by pharmacy, et cetera, medical, et cetera. And then we um, provide any large claims, usually over half the amount of your stop loss. So anybody at 75,000 or above, they usually want to see more data on those individuals. And then that will determine how they quote or if they quote. They're not required to quote, to my knowledge or not. You, you kind of touched on the coverage and the lag period, but uh, just organizationally, yeah, how much disruption would there be with transitioning from this model to another provider? Uh, not horrible. Uh, I think the biggest deal is to make sure we have the, the top 30 physicians and, and top 25 or whatever inpatient, outpatient facilities are part of the in-network provider plan. That way would disrupt the employees the least. Uh, the only um, disruption that we typically will find um, is if somebody's getting care now and has to change that provider care in the middle of their, their um, illness. There can be some pain regarding that because if the physician is not part of that program, the network, they will be considered non-network going forward. And so that will be a financial impact on the individual. So, and I may not know who that is <clears throat> because it may be a twenty thousand dollar claim going on that I have it doesn't show up on my report. I have no idea. So it can have some disruption in that piece of it. And then the city's internally is just going to ask some terminal claims to pay with Blue Cross, and then just start a new uh, county balance with a new carrier or TPA going forward. So. It can be done. Education is going to be key. You'll need to do enrollment meetings because they just won't take blanket. They'll have to do actual enrollment meetings with everybody. Make sure they select what they need, get all that data correct, and they're into the system. That way, that way the enrollment takes the most amount of time to make sure it's done right. They get their plan book, they get their ID card before the renewal. That's the most important. So is it possible to find or estimate how many employees, physicians would become out of network providers for any of say three possible plans. Well, I could, probably, that I could do that. Mm -hmm. I could do that for if you would like. I could pull if, up if, if we decided to. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. When we put the information together, we always provide the top twenty-five or fifty providers, as well as the top twenty-five or fifty drugs, to make sure that they're within their formulary and that mm -hmm. they're within their provider network. That way, it's very clear. And we usually have the enrollee, uh, the uh, the member count. I mean, uh, employees have been impacted, have gone to that physician or hospital. That way, you may say, "Well, this physician is not part of it." Yeah, but only one person went there. Okay, I just need to know that. Of course, it's probably going to be your wife, but uh, you know, it's always, <laughs> it's always the mayor. But it's always, yeah. <laughs> so this may not be a fair question, but knowing what you know about the market, knowing what you know about our renewal yeah. likelihood of significant savings or significant benefit in a, under a different plan? And I say benefit, significant perceived improvement from this plan to... I, I think Blue Cross of Kansas is starting to wake up. I think they're starting to show better care and case management than they ever have before. Uh, that, I think, has been one of their downsides where I think other carriers have probably been a little bit more uh, impactful. 
Um, but when a carrier is a little bit more impactful, it also means a little bit more um, participation by the, the employee member because they're going to be told what to do and where to go. And sometimes they don't like that. So, you know, so sometimes if you, I don't want to say that there aren't, I think, you know, both Cigna and Aetna and UHC, UHC is an extremely strong insurer, uh, but they can be a little cumbersome to work with. Good people, I have no problem with them. I mean, they're, they're the largest insurer in the country. Um, but, you know, Blue Cross of Kansas knows Kansas, and they know the Kansas physicians. They pay well and kindly. And some of the others, they have, sometimes there are some billing issues that have to be resolved. I was trying to think of the proper adjectives to use, and I think you did a very good <laughs> job. <laughs> My feeling is if it, if it isn't broken, there's not, you can't identify significant either savings on our end or, or better coverage for our employees. And are, are you satisfied with working with Blue Cross Blue Shield? I mean, have they been yeah, they're responsive? Easy. Yes. Yeah. They are. I miss my Blue Cross Blue Shield coverage. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I do have a concern just about the perceived disruption yeah. for the employees. Mm -hmm. I mean, it not. You know, if we, if pricing was bad, and, and, and granted, we're looking for savings for budget purposes, but this isn't, we're not experiencing a bad renewal that justifies um, Yeah, if I, was, if I was seeing a, an issue that wanted me to go out and, and get other bids and, and check out, I guess, but I'd have to see something really, really significant to make a change because, of, like you say, the disruption not only to staff, but also to, to the insured, I think would be, we'd have to have something really, really significant. And, and I'm repeating myself, but our employees pay attention. It'll be perceived disruption yeah. and that we're going at the market, let alone if we yeah. make the change. Yeah. Well, I think also when you got five, at least 500 employees, there's going to be one or two or something in there that's going to, it's going to disrupt somebody in that, in, in that thing. I mean, you know, it's, and you hate to be the one that, uh, throws them completely off kilter and have to go to, a, you know, that, that, that physicians, out, yeah, that physicians yeah. out of, uh, out of network. network. And, then, and there are very few physicians not in Blue Cross. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very few. And, I mean, but that being said, you know, I think, like I said, Blue Cross is getting better. Uh, they're probably not as innovative as some of the other carriers. But, again, it, <coughs> is you going to innovate? Right. And the reason uh, I, I asked uh, I've gone through with companies that are not named Blue Cross chains of insurers three times, and every year, or that every next year, oh well, you had that condition before, yes, but that was it's already a pre it's no longer a pre-existing condition, and it would take three to four months. Well, I don't know why this should have just gone through automatically. Said, well, you're a company. I mean, <laughs> make it go through automatically. Uh, but it eventually got resolved. But it's it made me very fearful of uh, January one of that new year. Well, you Don't know, what's well, interesting, and, and and I think Natalie keeps an ear on it because I send her stuff every now and then, and she's more she's very active in Sherm, the the um, HR uh, society. <coughs> But, you know, this is a moving target. And, you know, we keep our ear to the stone and says, you know, what's going on out here? You know, if somebody's making a play, or if there's a new innovative idea, or UHC is your top large employers now, well, we probably need to at least talk to them mid-year. <coughs> Excuse me, and just, why did they pick you? What's going on that makes <coughs> I'd rather really have that discussion mid-year before we even think about it coming to you and says, you know what, we probably don't need to market this this year. I'd rather have that information before I come up here to say that. But I think this next year is going to be an interesting year for us to see what's going on in this landscape. I just don't want that reserve fund to get too low because all you need is one bad West Nile outbreak or disease <coughs> unknown to, right, because then you have 20 sick people with, Hundred fifty thousand each cost you a lot of money. Sir. 
And were our benefit dates, they start on February 1st? <coughs> and I, I mean, I guess I was just curious as to why they don't start on January 1st. Is that just the way it's always been done? From what I can tell, at I'm least seeing smiles. Yeah. 50 to 20 years. Okay. And I don't know if it was just something to give the providers a break because so many companies are at um, a 1 1 renewal, but I really. Okay. Tell you the rationale. That's just, uh, speculation. Well, and my wife's Blue Cross is in March, but it's great for physicians. Mm -hmm. I mean, as in from the business side, because otherwise January is the month you make no money because everybody's in deductible. It's nice to have <laughs> some folks who don't start that new year until March or April. <laughs> no, seriously, that's a, yeah, <laughs> that, that's definitely a thing. Is it not in our benefit year calendar year as well? Or not? No, we're too late. Okay, too late. I knew I kind of contract too long, but is our benefit year too one to two one? Never mind, I stand corrected. Well, the last thing I want to do is come to you with a renewal and yeah. now for sure. time, yeah. and when you say, well, let's go to market, and we have to tell you uh, we can't. Too late. So, I wanted to have this conversation preliminarily. I, I agree um, based on the renewal rates and the satisfaction. I, I would tell you, you know, I, I, we try to put out um, a benefit statement to let our employees get a full understanding of what we provide them with for their retirement and health insurance. And, and I get more feedback from people outside of our organization on the great plan that we have than, than I do inside the organization until something comes up and someone has reason to really take advantage of it. It's 3.45 and uh, we'll be diligent going coming. forward though as, as well. For sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think we would all learn some new abbreviations today. Oh boy, love it. <laughs> It is 3.45, I guess public and employees can feel free to bring something up if they wish. Open, open the floor. I will, I guess. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, since Charles is here, it's nice to see what's out there. Are there other organizations that have wealth, health and wellness type incentives for employees that are possible for a city like ours. I used to work with them park and they did have them back then and I love them. But we have not had those here and for, for good reason, but you know if that's a possibility for us or not. The other ones in Salina? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hospital has yeah. a, a huge program. Okay. Yeah. But and, and we decided to know if they if that's possible for our city or not. We, you know they have tobacco cessation programs and if you went and got your blood drawn, you know, you, you were saw your provider once a year, or it, those were, they, were they, they made sense to me. So I mean, whether you wanted to do them or not was your choice, but they made sense that yeah, if you did that, you got a break, and it was very nice. So I don't know if that's possible for us. We brainstorm some of that. Now you might speak to what we've done and what we've seen in terms of participation in the health and wellness fair. Okay. Yeah, I'll back it up. I'm trying to think. The last time we brought <clears throat> an onsite fair it was probably. Maybe at least seven years ago. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we flies. did it for two to three years. We brought the on site and we provided incentives both for the employee as well as the spouse. The spouse recovered. Um, we offered gift cards, chamber bucks, just for coming and completing it, and we struggled with participation. Um, we were in the 20% range. Um, and our concern was we were putting a big investment into providing the time for all of the, um, the com care providers to be here to do the fair, and we did it multiple days, and we just weren't getting enough data back to make informed decisions on what our incentives should be or what we should be focusing on going forward. Um, after that, we tried a number of different um, activities, kind of a full menu, individuals could select from and log in and note what they did to achieve their points on a quarterly basis and we provided um, Jennifer helped me out with those chamber bucks or were those uh, discount <coughs> premiums or we tried both we did the rebate and premium yeah. quarterly um, yeah. decent participation there um, not really a way to gauge if it was effective we struggled with individuals logging in there and miraculously the first day of the month they did all their activities for all 30, 31 days. Um, anything to add on that? Yeah, that. <laughs> okay. 
and then really our shift after that was more along TRIA, just the investment there, kind of a different type of wellness. Um, we've, we've offered some different incentives, but not a comprehensive program or uh, rebate premiums or other large incentives since that time. Um, we've had different type of lunch and learns, educational providers come in addressing sleep, um, stress, diet, I'm trying to think of some of the other topics. Um, Nutrition, exercise. Yeah. We've looked at doing more of that. Um, actually have a couple of individuals that want to come in and talk to me about some potential opportunities. And then I did talk, um, what was the SLIM program? Natural SLIM. Mm -hmm. We've taken a look at that. And we have, this is probably in the last 30 days that I've seen a small presentation on that. Um, really more of the coaching and um, support for individuals seeking weight loss or health improvement from that facet um, and we could incentivize that so there are some opportunities but we really haven't I guess our, our biggest return has been on the TRIA program a different area of wellness where we have data and we can see where we're making an impact um, didn't, um, didn't you mention something about even being able to make a, a, a simple incentive like a, a primary care provider um, yearly checkup and providing a certain discount on that. I mean, I'm just wondering if maybe rather than, you know, trying to bite off like a huge new program implementation, that maybe there are, you know, one or two small steps that we could at least start out with that and see how, how people respond. If, you know, if you can bring us this form signed by your physician's office, then that'll get you in, in you know, so many dollars off either one time on a premium or this month or this much with every every premium to just kind of start incentivizing people to th start thinking proactively as opposed to reactively um, and Pre I premium reduction is a very mm -hmm. effective uh, carrot to dangle yeah absolutely yes. I failed to mention one that we have going on right now that we started probably about 60 days ago and it's offered through Blue Cross so there's very low administration about either um, weight loss or stress management. It's counseling and coaching that's offered via telephone. Um, completely optional. We don't have any information other than if someone gets a certificate that says they've completed it, they bring it in and we provide some chamber certificates. Um, so that's starting to pick up yeah, a I've, little bit. I think I've had more in the last month that have finished it, but they've just about had enough time to do all their sessions. But we could definitely take a look at incentivizing primary care. We have right. learned that a lot of our employees don't have a primary care physician. Right, and and I, I think you spoke to it too. Just you know, a, a, a premium <laughs> reduction, no matter you know how incremental. I think that kind of speaks. I mean, that that's what motivates um, Boo and me to participate with the hospital, as opposed to you know getting chamber bucks. I mean, I'm, I, and I don't know what the, and I may be an outlier, but that just. Well, that's cash in your pocket. You can spend yeah, it anywhere I mean, you want every, yeah. every two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Our so. annual plan, that's free, right? We have a, an annual, we have a, our plan gives us one annual checkup, the way I understand it. That is correct. That, that is correct. Yes, yeah, so that is, it doesn't even cost me. Right. We're just trying to get, get people to use it. Yeah, I thought that's, that's one of the nice things. I don't even have to pay a copay or a 50% off. Right. I, mean, I at least do that. Right. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Well, if you're in town, go out and see the International Aerobatics. Actually, I'll be here again on Friday. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what you can do in a thousand-meter square box. I'm very familiar with it. You're very